is why we're moving. Okay, the train, the train has entered the station at Coronaville, <laughs> a special place. We are all at this place, Coronaville. What's next? This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Wednesday and it's noon, uh, and we have our our regular team here. We have uh, Stephanie Dalton. Um, we have Cynthia Sinclair. We have Winston Welsh. Thank you for joining Coronaville here at the station, you guys. Thank you. Uh -huh. So, you know, I mean, the, pre the press is out there. The media is you know, focused on these crowds uh, all over the state. And as one, as one commentator put it, you know, that, that represents, you know, maybe 1% of the people in the world that were in the country. Um, and uh, the rest of them are sitting at home wondering what all the, you know, the commotion is about because uh, it, it may not deserve all the commotion it's getting. And uh, yeah, terrible thing happened, but this is really special. And so um, you, you wonder about the press because the press is reporting this, uh, may I say, ad nauseum every day, full tilt boogie all day long. And it's hard to resist it. My wife said she had enough already. She wasn't watching it. It was repetitive. Uh, why, you know, I, okay, I got it. I got the message. But, right. the, you know, the problem is they're not talking about the virus anymore. They gave it up. Um, you know, the priorities uh, have gone to the street scene. And the question is, what is going on with the virus? Uh, as Winston said before the show as well, you know, if we believe that the virus is, um, you know, is, is going to result in a resurgence, uh, the street scenes are going to result in a resurgence, uh, the incubation period hasn't passed yet. We're only uh, eight days in. And when we look again in two weeks, we, we may see real indication of that. There are, there are pockets, though. There are pockets uh, where the virus has arguably um, you know, increased. But what do you guys think about that? Is it possible that this isn't going to be as bad as we think, uh, Winston? I don't know. I, I, I was uh, interested to see Sweden um, was reporting now that their cases are sometimes, I think it's like about 10 times higher than their neighbors were. And they had this sort of open policy uh, and they have one of the highest death rates in the world uh, in pursuing sort of a, um, I don't want to even call it the herd immunity strategy, but that was one thing here in America. We're going to see what's happening now that the places are opening up. I don't think we really had we're not even in far enough from uh, Memorial Day weekend to see what those crowded beaches, swimming pools, and and all of that's going to actually translate to. But I will have the data here probably starting in about a week or um, a week and a half. So what's different about this, uh, Stephanie? I mean, <clears throat> are there factors here that could actually make this less of a resurgence than we might expect with all these hundreds of thousands of people in the streets all close to each other, some of them not wearing masks, spending hours in the middle of a crowd, all day in the middle of a crowd? Well, I think that uh, it is um, always an overestimate when the pro initial projection is made. And so when we don't meet that criteria, that level, this is a time for celebration. So um, I think the projection should be high, as high as it possibly can be, don't you think? I mean, that, that gives people the, key, the clue that this is dangerous. And then everybody goes about trying to uh, you know, flat, flatten, flatten that imaginary curve to not become the real curve. So There's I mean, that, all kinds of factors working. I mean, I remember seeing some of that coverage. Uh, there were signs that said, don't go back to work. You know, the protest is more important than going back to work. So if you are inclined to, you know, participate in the reopening, don't. Stay with us. Stay in the street. Um, and I think a lot of people, whether that, you know, thinking of that or articulating that or not, did stay in the street. They have been in the street day and night, uh, you know, in so many cities uh, all week long. And so the question is uh, whether it's more dangerous if they're in the street or uh, back to work. I'm not saying all of them can go back to work. Some of them, they got no jobs. Uh, some of them, you know, would be home instead of in the street. Uh, so it's really hard to get a, a handle on, on the, you know, the demograph, the demography here. So well, and what, what are the factors that are playing into whether this is as highly contagious as we might have, as we might have expected? And one of them is, you know, there was an article 
about um, distancing in the street. If you're outside, maybe this is one of the reasons Hawaii has had so few cases. If you're outside, you know, sunshine arguably kills the virus. If you're outside, the, the uh, droplets will sail off in, on the wind and, uh, you know, they won't, they won't be as focused as inside. They won't hang around and, and be so dangerous to the next person who enters the room, that sort of thing. Uh, it seems to me that's one factor, but what about it? I mean, uh, uh, is this more or less dangerous than what might otherwise be happening? Well, I think it's more dangerous, much more dangerous. When we first were talking about reopening the country, we all knew that there was going to be another spike when the country reopened. We did not expect the country reopen with a flood of people into the streets like they are. And, you know, most of the people are trying to be conscientious. They're using hand sanitizer. You see them out there going through the motions of trying to be careful. They're trying to stay, you know, a distance apart, wearing their masks, all of that. You know, but, I, saw, I saw some uh, footage of police, police dispensing hand sanitizer to the protesters. I thought that was really something. I saw, I saw police actually getting involved and in walking with the protesters and taking a knee with the protesters. And that's what I was really yeah. encouraged to see. I loved yeah. seeing that. You know, officers saying, yes, this is wrong and it doesn't represent all of us. Yeah. And I thought that was such an important statement to make when we yeah. were out there. But you know, we were afraid of that spike or we, we knew that spike was going to come when we reopened. But now that we reopened and that everybody's so close together, I'm afraid that that spike is going to be three times worse than we ever expected it to be. And I also think that it's possible that some of these guys that are out there protesting aren't actually genuinely there for the right reason. And I don't just mean the bad actors that are causing all the damage, but they're there because they've been locked in a house for two months and they just wanna get outside. And so they're going outside for those reasons. So I think that all of the protests are sort of a combination of people who are there because they really want to make their voice heard and they really want to see systemic change. And then I think there's people there that are bad actors to cause trouble. And then I also think that there's people that just want to get out of the house. And, yeah. and that's what bothers me. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a cooped up thing um, and, and drives them out into the street because they may not have jobs. You know, I was telling you yesterday, Winston, that um, there was some footage of um, some uh, some people who were arrested, young people. Most of this crowd was young um, by the police in New York, and uh, they these were the people who were doing mis mischief and uh, looting and what have you. And they were all lined up on the curb, and they were all handcuffed with those plastic ties, um, and waiting for the corrections van to come pick them up. And the camera, you know, kept going back to this line of people. There were a couple dozen of them along the curb. Um, and the remarkable, two remarkable things. One is, I didn't see any masks. Sorry, I didn't see any masks. Um, the other is, and this was really interesting, they were all howling. There, there were no African Americans sitting there that were being arrested. I don't know if this was a choice of the police. Maybe they were trying to make a point. Uh, or, or that possibly this is a you know a real phenomenon that the ones who were doing the mischief, at least in that area, were all howling. Um, but anyway, I mean, you know, I think um, uh, you got to you got to you know, you know the fact the fact, uh, Winston, is that we have been reopened for more than a week, right, around the country. If we were looking for a resurgence because of the reopening of the economy, thank you, Dr. Trump. Um, we've already seen it reopen in many places, but we have not seen, correct me if you feel otherwise, we have not seen any clear indication of a resurgence. Am I right about that? Well, I don't think we have seen that, but if it, if it is, you know, the news cycle is being dominated by other things. And for our viewers on the mainland, if I should point out that, that howling means Caucasian um, uh, as well. And, you know, as far as that goes, Hooligans and troublemakers and looters, uh, they don't need to, they're just, they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and uh, they should be you know, prosecuted to, to, to the fullest extent of the law because this is not helpful in all of this discussion. What, I, what seems to me about the coronavirus in this last week, um, 
despite, and the last two weeks actually, not, not including the, the riots, where people actually are wearing masks, but they're more afraid probably of tear gas and that sort of thing, or being videotaped as much as spreading coronavirus, um, is that we've, we've, we're seeing sort of an, I wanna call it an institutionalization of measures for when this virus will be coming back, whether it's in one week or two months or two years, that we are, we are permanently altering the way that we um, stand in line, deal with cashiers, pick out a shopping cart. There's the, the guy that's cleaning the shopping carts between everything at, at, the, at the supermarket. There's, they clean up the, the, the keypad so from someone else touching it, which I appreciate actually. Uh, this idea of, of permanently distancing, I don't know how the planes are gonna do it, but they're, uh, we're, we're entering a phase now that I don't think we will come out of. I don't see that. I think we're probably going to be in a permanent, I don't want to call it a quarantine mode, but a uh, don't touch me or get within six feet of me mode, maybe for for the duration of this. Well, I mean, that uh, takes us naturally to, you know, to deal with Fauci's remarks yesterday, where he said there would be, I forget how many, you know, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine available out of this uh, vaccine biotech company called Moderna. So I think it's an American company. Um, by the end of the year, um, now that, that's interesting because there were a number of candidates and that's the one he mentioned. He didn't mention the others. And I, and I also remember within the last couple of days, some articles and stuff on the, on the, on the tube um, showing clips of Fauci saying things that, um, that were, Mm, that were not mm, not not complimentary to him. Um, uh, remarks he made early on in this in this uh, pandemic, where he said, "Don't worry about it. This is not serious." And so, you know, his credibility now, for me, is personal. That's how I feel about it. His credibility is uh, has been undermined by these clips. And uh, now I'm wondering if there really is going to be a vaccine by the end of the year in which we can all get vaccinated. Uh, I mean, except for the anti-vaxxers who probably, you know, are out there waiting to refuse vaccinations. But this may change what you're talking about. Um, if, I, if, I, if you believe Fauci, uh, and, and there will be more news about it, I think, the, you know, the, the, the fickle finger of the media will go to cover that story. We'll hear more about it. Um, and that we, we are somehow convinced there's some of the reality there, that there will be hundreds of millions of vaccine doses available for Americans by the end of the year. I'm not going to worry so much, at least then, about a mask. I'm not going to worry so much about how close I am to other people. Um, I'm going to feel like this is nothing more than the flu because we have learned to manage it. Uh, so it's a psychological a, soci a social psychological thing is the psychology of the masses. And I suggest that if people start believing that the vaccine is coming and soon and will save us, they're not going to be concerned. And that's actually a worry because if they change their behavior, if they do not act conservatively, if they have no fear, then we are at greater risk. And if the vaccine fails, whoa. You know, right now, I think people are not as serious. Many people are not as serious. Look at those protesters. They're not as serious. What do you think, Stephanie? Oh, I think you're so right on, uh, Jay. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're already on that track, even without the Fauci announcement about the, the Santa vaccine, uh, because people understand from the data that's been promulgated that, that, that you know, the African-Americans are duly, are, are affected very badly. By the back by the virus, and the young, the group that's out there protesting is not. You know, they may be infected; they're all eligible for that, but they may not. They're not going to die. Their death rate is very low, although some have died. But I, I think that people have concluded from that that they're fairly well protected, as and that this is not worse than the other viruses we're dancing around all the time. You know, one so, thing that occurs to me from what you say is that people are out there protesting. I mean, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a rainbow of protest out there. Um, and they're young. And the likelihood is, uh, you know, they're not going to die. That's the probability. That's you know, you have a huge, there was a study in England, huge uh, 
risk if you're older, huge. Absolutely. It's many, many, 10 times more. <laughs> but if you're young, not. The problem is with the young people who may be catching it from others in the protest, they're spreaders. They're spreaders. They're going to go home. They're going to go to their families. They're going to they're going to talk to older people. And if they're shedding virus all over other, uh, you know, other age groups in the in the in the you know the community, then we have a, a, a silent. And and your point, Winston, about it takes another eight days. Well, <clears throat> we're not tracking. Have you noticed? We're not tracking at all. Zippity doo oh, tracking. Do. We, so, so if these people go back into the community as young, relatively safe spreaders, and they shed virus all over all other age groups, we'll have no control over this thing, and and the and the resurgence won't happen in eight days more. It'll happen in a couple months more, and we won't have any way of dealing with it. That's right. But it, as maybe we've just decided, the powers that be that says this is just the way it's going to be. We're going to reopen the economy because the deaths of despair and having a 25 to 40% of the population out of work. Uh, maybe uh, people say, oh, that's why they're able to go to the riots because they don't have anything to do. They don't have a job to go to, so they're able to go there. And this is gonna cause a lot more damage than you know, whatever percent of, of people who are over a certain age. I mean, let's face it, this, is, uh, this is, affects older Americans much more than younger Americans for right now that we know of. We don't know what long-term effects of this is gonna be. Maybe these, these things are gonna render people sterile. We really don't know. Well, that's true. What that's true. And every day you find another article about some bizarre aspect of the virus, uh, with a you know what is it, a COVID toe already? Yeah. And the article you mentioned a minute ago about uh, how this is really attacking the the circulatory system and epithelial tissue, epithelial tissue in the body, and having all kinds of secondary effects that we don't know about. We yeah. don't know how it works. And that's um, why, the, when you mentioned Mel Fauci's announcement, it may be part of that ju that just says, you know what, folks, we've worried so much for the last two, three months. We freaked everyone out. Everyone's been in their cage, their own cage. And now we look at Sweden, we look at India, we're looking at all around the world, and we're not seeing like a third of the population die. Some people are dying, some aren't. We don't really know why or how or when. Sometimes this virus is super bad, like in Italy, and other times it doesn't seem to be that bad in neighboring countries. So maybe they've just decided, you know, hell with it. Let's just kind of let it go. Let's hope we have enough equipment right now after a few months that we've been able to order more masks or whatever. It, it feels like that to me. It feels like now the emphasis is on let's restart the economy. Let's deal with the virus. Would, would, you, would you guys please continue to be conservative? I'd like to continue the show. I'd like to have all of you here. Um, it's not the coronavirus there are still great anywhere. risks out there. You know, one of the things, Cynthia, is that there's a lot of um, a lot of disinformation, like the guy who uh, said, "Oh, the vitality of the virus is is diminishing," and that has not been repeated because I think that was disinformation. But then, if you look if you look on the web and get the email, um, there are so many people who are you know selling you old T-shirts for masks. Um, you know, and I mean, there's so many different kinds of masks and none of them are really surgical masks, even surgical masks, none of them are really all that effective. And if you at the crowd of protesters, I really wonder how many of them were using adequate masks. Um, but that's not the other thing. There's all kinds of hocus pocus, you know, mm, you know, snake oil going on there. Uh, and are people buying into that? Do you think they w will or uh, will continue to buy into that. I think it's very partisan, the reactions. I think that the people that follow Trump are not going to go with masks, and the people that have half a brain are going to. And yeah, maybe some of the masks weren't the best masks that were out there in the crowds, but they were at least trying. But I have some numbers here for you guys. Um, you said there hasn't been really a spike that we've heard about. Well, it's because we haven't heard about it. As I go down the list, New York is up by a thousand. Illinois is up by a thousand. Massachusetts is up by 3,600. Uh, Pennsylvania up 600. This is per day. Uh, Texas is up by a thousand. Um, the, all the big ones, Maryland is up by 800. Virginia is up by 800. And it's going down the list, you know, they're all, Arizona is up by a thousand. 
Tennessee is up by 800. So there, there has been a spike, but it's a very manageable spike, right? Which was what the whole point of flattening the curve was all about. So now that we flattened the curve and we did really well, and now we're able to not overtax our healthcare system, and now we're gonna have another spike that's going to over tax our healthcare systems coming from all these these protests i believe anyway yeah so, well you're right i mean I, i'm really glad you have those numbers and that, that does show that there has been a reaction you know right. in the in the uh, in the virus in the, in the infection uh, and, on the other hand that does sound manageable in view of the fact that the curve was being you know diminished uh before that Therefore, right. the, the, we, we probably have sufficient hospital infrastructure to, to handle it. Um, so what I'd really like to hear going on- For now, with, for now. Yeah, for now. What I really want to hear is that the, the government is restocking all of those hospitals, overstocking them, getting ready for this next flare that's going to come. We're going to get a spike, and I don't hear anybody talking about that. Sure, they have the PPE that they need right now, but what if they get a huge spike? They don't have- yeah. are, you, are you sure about that? I think it's just going off the radar. Do we, have, do we have enough testing? We should be testing all over the place and we should be tracking. Right. Let, and let, me, let me go back to Fauci for a minute though, because mm -hmm. somehow this has to be, it has to be put in perspective. So one of the very strange things that, uh, is his relationship with Trump. And um, was it yesterday that uh, there were some articles about how he hasn't seen Trump and he hasn't been at meetings of this elusive task force. Remember, the task force was to be supposed to be run by Pence and, yeah. and Jared was there and supposed to do something. And I, you know, and, and the people who used to sit around the room um, behind Trump and these, uh, press conference rally meetings of his um, aren't there. And Fauci's not there. And Fauci doesn't know, according to this article, he doesn't know why exactly or, or what is happening with the task force because there are not a lot of meetings of the task force. So what is happening to our federal effort? I mean, you know, you could, this is, this is the subject of a whole new show but it, it just seems to me that um, when he stands in front of the church with the Bible, when he makes these outrageous threats of violence, uh, when he distracts everybody with calling in the, the army, um, he's, not, he's not paying attention to the virus. He's not doing anything about the virus. Um, I mean, am, am I missing something, Winston? Has, has he got something going on here? Or it's has a, he just turned his back on the whole thing? Oh, I, it, he did. It, it's... It's just a distraction that he's able to get rid of now on a way towards mo something more, more interesting, which is um, consolidation of more power. I think one sad thing about, you mentioned Dr. Fauci or Deborah Burks or, or at the CDC, Dr. Redfield, we have had, now we don't trust even this, the information coming from the government. We want to, and I basically do. I want to say the CDC is a good, organization they do great work there the, the huge majority of people join that because they're the top scientists in their field but it's been politicized uh the the institutes of health the the the, the task force um they're having to go in and say don't inject please do wear masks whatever it is and now we just quit who the world health organization how is that helping anything because we were told oh well this is a it's a chinese organization that's that's against america well, I, whatever the reasons were this, this is our basic world health organization. It's been with us for a good, what, 75 years? This is all part and parcel of the casualty of the last four years of wreckage of us losing faith in basic institutions mm -hmm. um, because we're told uh, we can't trust this anymore. And therefore, we start to say, and there's, there's always the smallest kernel of truth in things, whether it's for journalism or the, uh, uh, the media or or, or in this case, government institutions. So it makes us confused. The masses don't need much. Even experts don't need much to read an article and say, well, I read this. Well, now, you know, Lancet has to go back in and say, actually, the information we were getting wasn't right on, and we're sorry we published that. 
So that just feeds the whole fire. Yeah, and, and the difference between what we are getting from government and what we should be getting from government is really huge. I mean, just for example, um, you know, there's an, there's an ad from the CDC, um, a, you know, a sort of public announcement, public service announcement ad on television. And it is down at the, at the fourth grade level. Uh, it is saying you should wash your hands and maintain social distance. I mean, you know, uh, it's ridiculous. There's so much that we don't know about the virus. There's so much advice we should be getting on how to conduct our lives that we are not getting. And they're repeating information that's months old in a fast moving pandemic. It is extraordinary how little they have given us. So, I, I mean, I blame Trump for wrecking the CDC, but I think we have to recognize that it's wrecked. It's giving us fourth grade information in a pandemic, which, which, which science is, is learning things every day. The CDC doesn't report any of that. Uh, wouldn't you rather be informed by a credible government organization like the CDC, the one that has been looking after us and our health you know, for 100, 150 years? I, I don't understand why they think that we're satisfied with fourth grade in information. It will be part of the reconstruction of our nation after in seven months, hopefully, when we step back and we say, how did we get into this mess and how do we, how do we rehabilitate ourselves and get out of it? And to the point where we do respect our, our, our these critical uh, organizations of government. And for the, the time being, we rely on them as much as we can, but we also look at our state, our local uh, companies, we have to, you, if you want the real news in this country, you pretty much have to do your own sleuthing and try and figure out what's there. And that well, is- that's, that's a whole new discussion and a whole new show. Because <clears throat> what, was, what is happening with Twitter um, and what's the other one, chat, Snapchat now in the paper about them, uh, you know, discounting what Trump says and pointing out that Trump is lying. Um, that is so important, and it, it not only goes for Trump, it goes for people around Trump. But and, and, and my unhero of the day is Mark Zuckerberg, because Facebook, you know, just publishes that stuff uh, like a pipeline. And, it's and very so we're not getting good information. It's terribly unhelpful because we see stuff on Facebook, we see it on the news, we, we want to trust the sources, and yet we're told not to trust anything. So you end up with just a whole bunch of misinformation, disinformation that's mixed in with the real good stuff in there. So, uh, you know, folks- Confusion. Yeah, confusion. Yeah, that's what we have. We have confusion, and therefore we do not have uh, uh, reasonable, rational, effective moves by the public in terms of dealing with their own lives. And we, and we lose our priorities, and I think into a, a certain degree, we've lost the priorities with the protest. I mean, is it necessary for the, you know, get this political thing in the protest and this, you know, racism issue in the protest, but how many of those people are worried about shedding virus back to their families? I mean, it's still with us. We have to build it into everything we do and we're not getting information that helps us make that choice. So it looks like we're almost out of time, Stephanie, can I get some closing thoughts from you? Who do you trust? You know, one, one statement I'd like you to deal with is, well, you can trust Coronaville. We'll tell you the truth. Am I right? <laughs> we can roll up to that because we can't trust who's making the policies and, and hopefully and be coming from the federal level. I mean, remember that with all your saving, even even with the WHO and um, NIH and, and CDC and all of that, it's just the same pattern as, um, as it has been with Kellyanne Conway. Where is she now? Okay. And where is um, Ju Rudy Giuliani? Where is he now? And then Pence, hey, where's he gone? He was the head of the team. And so it just, and now who, who, where did they go? And so it's this constant repertoire of his to just bring it up, use it for whatever purpose, ring it out and dump it and then move on and leave all of everybody left, you know, with no end to the Senate. So I just see it as creating that more confusion, making sure nobody gets a grasp of this and hopefully CDC, Coronaville here and uh, NIH and Dr. Fauci will keep, you know, is enough of a, of a momentum, you know, keep pushing the good work forward and getting it published in our newspapers, you know. Yeah, we have, we have to keep, we meaning all of us, we have to keep working on the issue and, and keeping it high priority. I mean, 
even the uh, reopening, Congress is locked on whether to give more money to people who are out of work and their money is expiring. And, and the Republicans are saying, we don't want to give them a, a penny more. Oh my God. So now you have no action by the federal government uh, in dealing with the disease and you, and you have a, a diminution, a termination of action to reopen. Just a lot of talk. Um, this is a big problem and we don't know the consequences. So does this make you feel good, Cynthia, or what? None of this makes me feel good. It actually breaks my heart. I've spent so much time in tears because we've lost so many people. Over 100,000, 108,000 people have died from this virus. And I think that the, the enormity of that is kind of lost on people, especially with all this new stuff with the protests and sort of overshadowing all that. And granted, yes, what happened to Floyd, I mean, to uh, George Floyd was awful. And police have been doing that forever. And, and it needs to change. But I wish that people could be a little more careful out there and keep in their minds that this virus is not the innocuous thing that some of the media and some of the administration are trying to tell us. And it is a deadly thing and people need to treat it as such. Yeah, oh, touche, I mean, I mean a very good point. Uh, Winston, let's, let's let you close. You're gonna deliver the, the message, the port parole here today. Uh, you're going to try to clear, clear up uh, all the issues and, and give good advice to anyone who watches this uh, here in, in early June 2020. Well, you know, like uh, when I first started, have a lot of aloha for each other. We're not out of the woods. Our economy has collapsed in Hawaii. We're 40 percent unemployment. We're restarting again. This is not going to be an easy road back. The seniors in your life, the kapuna, they still need you, for you to go to Longs and Safeway for them. You need to go check on your neighbors. You need to be a human. You need to, uh, to step up in all ways that you can. Take care of yourself first. Um, when you go out, take care of others. But take care of yourself. Take care of your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual uh, health as best as you can, or you're not going to be able to help others. Yeah, so, there um, it is. I mean, when you aloha. come down to it, our survival is based on our survival as a community, a, a statewide community or a national community, for that matter, a planetary community, is based on the notion of caring for the other person. Let's all care for each other. If we can do that, we can, we can survive. Well, thank you very much. Stephanie, Cynthia, Winston, always a great discussion.